I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe Nation, on whose land we gratefully stand today, and also the support of the Canada Council for the Arts and the Ontario Arts Council, who provided research and creation grants for the production of this work, which allowed me to purchase materials, pay for studio space, and travel twice to Spain and Italy to prepare and research this work. Money means a lot, but time is everything, and for the gift of time, I acknowledge and thank OCAD University for supporting me through a one-year sabbatical and a six-month leave of absence that allowed the space and solitude required to complete this work. I'd also like to thank my musical and intellectual collaborator on this project, David Delary, a gifted Anishinaabe musician and composer who contributed immeasurably to the exploration and production and who was with me when at last we came to Laura Vida. This exhibition records a journey, call it a research project, that began two years ago when I began to think about the bifurcated worldview that imagines the globe divided in two. On one side lies the old world, on the other, the new. This curious binary image and all it attempts to describe and all it attempts to obscure became the impetus for a growing desire to look for Christopher Columbus. For it seemed that he and his voyages were somehow at the root of this peculiar concept of duality under which we continue to labor even today, 524 years after he first set foot on the Americas. To find him, Christopher Columbus, I mean, I traveled first to Genoa, Italy, where he was born, and then to Spain, where he died. Seeking the documents and the records of his life in the hope that these writings would provide a key to the truth of the man and his ideas. Only many months into the search did I realize I'd been pursuing a dead end. Whether Columbus ever existed, or if he was simply a conglomerate, a construction of memory, imagination, and propaganda contrived to satiate our collective need for a symbol, a hero, or a god, no longer seemed to matter to me. Whatever he was, the minutia and fabric of his life no longer held either mystery or answer, and I began to despair that I'd thrown away half of my precious sabbatical on a useless and meaningless search. Yet, something significant did remain. If it was not Columbus himself, it was something more abstract, more desperately important, that had struck out like a reverberating wave from the first explosive contact 524 years ago when Columbus landed on the Caribbean islands and brushed against the American continents that lay just beyond. Something that had expanded and multiplied and diversified like waves and that continues to reverberate and drive in upon us even today. David Delary and I traveled to Madrid to look at galleries, museums and archives. And we went to Seville to see more archives and tapestries and collections of navigational instruments. And from there, we went to the port of Cadiz, south of Seville, on the Atlantic coast of Spain, to see the sea and gaze in wonder, as Columbus himself must have, at the line of the distant western horizon. Finally, we came to the little town of Palos de la Frontera on the Rio Tinto, from where Columbus and his companions first set sail. But somehow, the village of Paulos confounded us, closed itself up, and refused us access to its story. Only on the second trip to Spain, five months later, did the town finally reveal what I was looking for. On a little shelf of land under the walls of the medieval church of San Jorge, 
we saw the now dry docking place where Columbus must have boarded the Santa Maria. And a few meters away, the ancient well that surely supplied the water for the voyage. Here was the place where it had begun, the very place where Columbus and his crew must have stood. Yet despite even the wonder and awe of that place, I realized that this was not yet the site for which I, for which I was seeking. The pretty little town of Palos had a museum and monuments to the Columbus voyage. But these were dry, patriotic, and somehow closed. It was, after all, a, a tourist site and didn't open in the way that I was hoping that it would to the deeper story of Columbus. So the next day, we drove a couple of kilometers to the south to a place where the Rio Tinto and the Rio Odiel converge. And there, on an outcropping of rock that presides over the site where the two great rivers meet and flow out into the Atlantic, lies a small Franciscan friary. It's called the Monasterio de la Rabida. And there, suddenly, the source of the great magnetic field that had drawn me on this search revealed itself. The resulting exhibition, La Rabida, Soul of Conquest, an Anishinaabe Encounter, opened here at the Art Gallery of Peterborough on September 17, 2016. The exhibition includes sculpture, drawing, painting, and video that collectively explore the various impacts and European justifications for the conquest of the New World. The exhibition incorporates an original choral work for Four Voices by David Delary, an anti-hymn whose words are the Latin text of the papal bull Intercetera, the Doctrine of Discovery, 1493. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Celeste Scopolidis and Finn Leach, director and curator of the Art Gallery of Peterborough, for their support and assistance during the production of, da of David Delary's music and for the installation of this work. It seems important, before I get any further into this talk, to qualify the term research within, with respect to my practice. I am an artist before I am a scholar. My work in the studio is founded on an extensive use of original source material, both written in words and depicted in images, that a friend has described as careful archival sleuthing. And I am much more comfortable with that term than with what I imagine is meant by academic research. My presentation today will discuss the results of my careful archival sleuthing and describe the methodology and my process. I was interested in the concept of two worlds, the old world, meaning Europe, and the new world, meaning here. This is a Portillon chart of the two worlds. Portillon charts, also called harbor finding charts, are early navigational maps from the European Middle Ages, around 1300 to 1500, and mark the beginning of professional cartography. The Portillon charts were characterized by rum lines, lines that radiate from the center um, of the map in the direction of the wind or the compass points that were used by pilots to lay courses from one harbor to another. The charts were usually drawn on vellum and embellished with a frame and other decorations. Many portillons encompass only Western Europe and the Mediterranean Ocean, but some Catalan charts can be considered world maps. Here is my version of a Portillon chart. It is titled Saturn's Rock, La Rabida, and is a picture on canvas in acrylic paint. It's 10 feet high by 11 feet wide. Like the medieval cartographers, 
I used drum lines to devise it, stretching cotton string horizontally, vertically, and diagonally across the center of the picture plane in an attempt to navigate my way across its surface. After this picture was finished, I learned that Inca artists and scribes used similar diagonal lines made of string in their drawings to delineate hierarchies of power and influence. Thus, the line running from the upper right corner to the lower left indicates the dominance of the right side of the picture, the solar side, the masculine figure, over the figure on the left, the maiden. In thinking of the two worlds, the old world and the new, I was reminded of the archetypes from old creation stories, which usually involve celestial bodies. In particular, I remembered the Old Testament story in Genesis, which describes God's creation of the two great lights. I am indebted to Sarah Yehudit Schneider's text, Kabbalistic Writings on the Nature of Masculine and Feminine, for her interpretation of this metaphor, and to my friend Annette Poisner for introducing me to it. Regarding the Kabbalah references in this work, I'm specifically interested in the discussion of gender roles and their origin in the Judeo-Christian creation story. Quote, and God made the two great lights, the great light to rule by day and the smaller light to rule by night. Schneider examines this story in great detail, particularly in reference to the R. Isaac Luria 16th century text called The Diminished Moon. Though these studies are tangential to the deeper experience and research I undertook in Spain, yet they provide a rich theoretical foundation to my ongoing meditation on the underlying binary social structure under which we all strive to find justice. This is the image on the right side of the painting, Saturn's rock, La Rabida. It is, of course, the sun, but, is, but it is also a European, obviously a Spanish conquistador. This is the source of the image in the painting. Juan Ponce de Leon, born 1474 and died in July 1521. He was a Spanish explorer and conquistador. He was the first governor of Puerto Rico by appointment of the Spanish crown and led the first known European expedition to mainland North America in 1513 when he named the region La Florida and claimed it for Spain. This monument to Ponce de Leon is just outside St. Augustine, Florida. This is the image on the left side of the painting. It is, of course, the moon. I have made this side of, of the overlap circles feminine, represented by a crouching woman or girl. I call her the maiden. And this is the source image from which it is drawn. The children of Lulay Laco in the Andes Mountains, Argentina, 1999. The children of Lulay Laco are a group of three mummies discovered by Dr. Johann Reinhardt and his archaeological team on the 16th of March, 1999, at Mount Lulay Laco, which lies on the border of Chile and Argentina. The burial is believed to have taken place 500 years ago around the time of the Columbus landings. The image in this painting is of the oldest mummy, a girl around the age of 15, who is believed to have been an achila, or sun virgin. They call her La Doncella, the maiden. La Doncella is currently on display at the Museum of High Altitude Archaeology in Argentina. This is my rendering in glass of La Doncella, the maiden. In the center of the overlapping spheres is an image of the friary of La Rabida, a Franciscan monastery in the southern Spanish town of Palos de la Frontera, on a rocky outcropping overlooking the confluence of the Tinto and Udiel rivers. 
The site of La Rabida has been known since antiquity as Saturn's rock. It was the site of an ancient Phoenician altar to the deity Melkat or Baal of Tyre. And later, it was a Roman temple to the goddess Proserpina. Later still, it became an Arab monastery. The name Rabida or Rapita is derived from the Arabic word for watchtower. In the 12th century, the site housed the Knights Templar and it became a Franciscan friary in the 13th century. The Franciscans have held great influence in the region ever since. Christopher Columbus stayed at the friary in 1490, two years before his first voyage. During his stay, Fra Francisco Jimenez de Cesernos, the guardian of La Rabida and confessor to Queen Isabella, successfully intervened when King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella initially rejected Columbus's request for funding for his expedition in search of the Indies. The friary was declared a Spanish national monument in 1856 and is currently under consideration by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. The constellations on the top and bottom edges of the painting represent the stars that were visible in the night sky on April 29, 2016, the day that I discovered this site and claimed it for the Anishinaabe. They are Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Draco, Camelopardalis, and Cepheus. This is the monument to Christopher Columbus that stands on the Rio Tinto at its confluence of the river Odial near La Rabida in Huelva, Spain. Columbus was born between the 31st of October, 1450 and the 30th of October, 1451 in Genoa, Italy and died on 20th of May, 1506 in Valladolid, Spain. He was an Italian explorer, navigator, colonizer, and citizen of the Republic of Genoa. Under the auspices of the Catholic monarchs of Spain, he completed four voyages across the Atlantic Ocean. These voyages and his efforts to establish permanent settlements on the island of Hispaniola initiated the European colonization of the New World. He is gazing west on the Rio Tinto River, visible from La Rabida. And this is my version of the monument to Columbus. I call it a looking glass. This is an image of um, a drawing that I made um, titled Friday, August the 3rd, 1492. It is ink graphite, colored pencil, and watercolor on paper. It includes the text from the log of the first voyage of Columbus, abstracted from the Barcelona copy of the Voyages of Columbus by Bartolome de las Casas, published in 1530. The image is from the Nueva Coronica Buen Gubiniero by Guaman Poma, which was made in 1615 it is drawing number 149 in the chapter of the Spanish Conquest. This is the monument to Bartolomé de las Casas in Sevilla, Spain. Bartolomé de las Casas was born in 1484 thereabouts and died on the 18th of July, 1566. He was a Spanish historian, social reformer, and Dominican friar. His extensive writings, including a short account of the destruction of the Indies and Historia de las Indias, chronicle the first decades of colonization of the West Indies and focus particularly on the atrocities committed by the colonizers against the indigenous peoples. Arriving as one of the first European settlers in the Americas, he initially participated in but eventually felt compelled to oppose the atrocities he saw committed there. 
In his early writings, however, he advocated the use of African slaves instead of indigenous peoples in the West Indian colonies, and thus has been criticized as at least partly responsible for the transatlantic slave trade. This is my rendition of Bartolome de las Casas, uh, rendered in glass uh, with a walnut stand and brass fittings. This is an image from a short account of the destruction of the Indies by Bartolome de las Casas in 1542. It was a, an account of his firsthand witnessing of the early colonization efforts. The engraving is by Theodore de Bray and was made in 1656. A short account of the destruction of the Indies was published in 1552 and was about the mistreatment of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and is one of the first attempts by a Spanish writer of the colonial era to depict examples of unfair treatment that indigenous peoples endured in the early stages of the Spanish conquest of the Greater Antilles, particularly the island of Hispaniola. And this is my rendition of um, de las Casas' um, account and de Bray's engraving. It's called Destruction of the Indies, and again is rendered in glass. This is an image from the Codex Kingsbro, a petition of the Indians of Tepet Lo Aztoc, uh, the Encomienda. It was made in Sinaloa, Mexico in 1550. The Encomienda what is a dependency relation system developed in Spain during the Roman Empire. Powerful landowners were granted protection under this um, relation system, um, granted protection to peasants in exchange for service or tribute. Encomenderos were responsible for instruction in the Spanish language, the Christian faith, to protect um, their wards from warring tribes and pirates, and to develop and maintain infrastructure in the communities. In return, the indigenous people paid tributes of metal in gold and silver or in maize, wheat, and pork. However, in many cases, they were forced to do hard labor and were subjected to extreme punishment and even death if they resisted. This is my version of the encomienda, also rendered in glass. This piece is from uh, the Nueva Coronica y Bien Gubernero by Guaman Poma, made in 1615. Guaman Poma was born in around 1535 and died in 1616. He was a Quechua nobleman and chronicler who denounced the ill treatment of the indigenous peoples of the Andes during the Spanish conquest. Guaman Poma's illustrated chronicle, Nueva Coronica Buen Gubernero, the first new chronicle and, and good government, is a 1,189 page document, the longest sustained critique of Spanish colonial rule produced by an indigenous subject in the entire colonial period. Written between 1600 and 1615 and addressed to King Philip III of Spain, Poma's original manuscript has um, probably never was delivered uh, to the King of Spain, but is instead kept in the Danish Royal Library since at least the early 1660s. It came into public view only in 1908. And this is my page um, rendered in glass from Guaman Poma's chronicle. It is entitled, The Inca Asks What the Spaniard Eats. The Spaniard replies, gold. This is the monument to Fra Junipero Serra at the Mission San Juan Capistrano in California, USA. Junipero Serra y Frera um, was born November 24, 1713 and died August 28, 1784. He was a Roman Catholic Spanish priest and friar of the Franciscan order 
who founded a mission in Baja, California, and the first nine of 21 Spanish missions in California, from San Diego to San Francisco during the 18th century. Sarah was beatified by Pope John Paul II on September 25, 1988, and canonized by Pope Francis on September 23, 2015. Several indigenous groups opposed Sarah's sainthood because of his treatment of their ancestors and his zealous work to suppress their culture. And this is my rendition of Saint Unipera Sera, again rendered in glass. And this is the town seal of the town of Whitesboro, Oneida County, New York State. The Whitesboro seal originated in the early 1900s. It displays town founder Hugh White choking an Oneida man, though town officials contend that it depicts a friendly wrestling match that White won, thereby gaining the respect of the Oneida. The current version of the seal, which I have cast in glass for this exhibit, was created in 1970 after an indigenous group launched a lawsuit against the town. The version used before the suit showed the settler's hands on the Oneida man's neck instead of on his shoulders. The seal attracted more controversy in 2016 when village residents voted 157 to 55 to keep the seal as is rather than explore alternative images. And this is my image of the seal in glass. This is my drawing entitled Atahualpa Inca in his prison at Cajamarca. It is ink, graphite, colored pencil, and watercolor on paper. It is from the text of the Nueva Coronica Buen Gubianero by Guaman Poma, circa 1615. It is page 386 of his account. The image is from the Nueva Coronica y Buen Gubianero by Guaman Poma, 1615. It is titled by Poma, Atahualpa Inca and Friar Vincente de Valverde in Cajamarca. It is drawing number 154 in the chapter of the Spanish Conquest. In addition to the glassworks, the painting, and the two drawings, I collaborated with um, David Delary to make a video and record um, a choral work. It is entitled Inter Ketera, May 1493 and Dudum Siquidum, October 1493. The video was directed and photographed by myself. It was edited by David Delary. The music was composed by David Delary and performed by Melody Thomas, who was the first soprano, Emily Templeman, the second soprano, David Hunter, the tenor, and Colin McAdam, the bass, all of Peterborough, Ontario. The text for the Intercatera, May 1493, is a papal bull issued by Pope Alexander VI on May 4th and ratified as the Dudum Sequidum in October 1493. The larger version of the text is also known as the Doctrine of Discovery, the bull which granted all lands to the west and south of a pole-to-pole -pole line, 100 leagues west and south of any of the islands of the Azores or the Cape Verde Islands to Spain and the crowns of Castile and Aragon. This document was, is often used as a justification and license for colonization in the name of the Christian evangelism. The inter Catera papal bull called for non-Christian nations to be reduced and subjugated. Various indigenous groups in the Americas have organized protests and raised petitions seeking the repeal of the papal bull inter Catera to remind Catholic leaders of the record of conquest, disease, and slavery that remains a legacy of European colonialism in the Americas to this day. On May 6, 2016, Stephen Newcomb met face to face with Pope Francis and asked to have the Intercatera Papal Bull revoked. On November 3, 2016, 
the Globe and Mail newspaper reported that, quote, hundreds of clergy of various faiths joined protests Thursday against the Dakota Access oil pipeline at Standing Rock, North Dakota, singing hymns, marching, and ceremonially burning a copy of a 600-year-old document, end quote. That document was the Intercatura, the Doctrine of Discovery. <laughs>